Uh, when it comes to uh, praying, the Bible is full of uh, principles how to pray effectively, heavy on the how to pray. Uh, and I'll give you uh, some uh, idea of, of how to pray uh, from what the scriptures say. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, Christ's uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, but when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who, see, who sees in secret, speaking of God, the Heavenly Father, he, he will repay you, or he will listen when you're in private. Uh, the Pharisees were listening to this because they were really great on praying publicly. In fact, they didn't spend time praying privately. They wanted uh, everyone to see just how great they could pray eloquent prayers in public and so Jesus is basically saying, don't be hypocritical in you, when you pray. Uh, if you don't spend much time in private praying, you should not be the first person praying in public for all to hear you. It's kind of convicting. But how much time do you spend in your inner closet talking to God? Um, here's another one. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 6, the next verse. The Lord said, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition, or in our vernacular, canned prayers that were written by somebody. Uh, he says, as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Translated, the more I use these repetitious words, the gods will eventually hear me. Jesus says, uh, no, the true God will not listen to that. He, he wants to hear from your heart. Uh, but again, uh, the Pharisees were really great on teaching people all of these, these prayers they had devised. Uh, when I was flying to Israel, uh, my first time to go to Israel, uh, back right after 9-11, um, I was on a plane. There weren't many people going to Israel for obvious reasons. Uh, because the attack here, and so the plane was fairly empty, and sitting behind me was a Jewish rabbi from Maui. I kept saying, that's a great place to serve God. <laughs> Have any openings there? Um, and uh, so he had never talked, uh, he had never uh, spoken to a, a Gentile pastor, nor one that knew Hebrew. He thought that was an anomaly. I had never spoken to a Jewish uh, rabbi, and so we talked uh, all the way across the United States for four and a half hours, and had a great discussion. He, I said, you ask questions, I'll answer. I'll ask questions, you answer. We had a great conversation uh, between us. But when we landed in Toronto, uh, he handed me a tefillin, a prayer book. And he said, perhaps when you take off to go to, to uh, Israel, you will need to recite this prayer. This is for prayer at takeoff. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and he says, when you're landing uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, turn to this page and pray this prayer uh, in Hebrew. Pray this prayer for landing. Oh, excellent. I never knew those existed. Uh, Pharisees are alive and well, are they not? Yeah. And so they had them all devised, taken off, you know, probably what, what kind of food you eat on the plane. There's a prayer for that. Who knows? Uh, but Jesus said, don't, don't, no, none of these vain repetitions. Let, pray from your heart. Uh, don't forget that unconfessed sin will adversely affect your prayer life. How do I know that? Well, Isaiah said to the sinful Israelites, chapter 59, I'm getting to my sermon. Just stay with me. Uh, chapter 59 of Isaiah, he says this the prophet. Uh, I, behold, uh, the Lord's hand is not too short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Here's the problem. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Translated, until you confess your sin. Well, God's there, but he's not listening to work actively in your life until you confess your sin. What's that mean for us? Same thing. If I'm looking at my prayer life going, it's just not as effective as I think it should be. You should be looking at yourself to say, God, what sin do I need to confess? And if you think that you have no sin, it is now time to ask the question. God, show me my sin. He will answer that forthrightly. Uh, those are three negative things. You feel like you need a positive one? I'm, I'm feeling. The negative people are thinking, no, more negative. Uh, the, <laughs> the positive are thinking, yeah, the glass is half full. Give me a positive one. Here's a positive uh, thing about how to pray. Um, do remember to pray with a spirit of thanksgiving, that you're thankful. You're not always grumbling in God's presence. You're thankful when you enter his presence. Uh, Philippians 4, 6. Paul says, and most Christians know this, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything, the good, the bad, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He said, when you come to God, think of Paul's life, what he went through, stoned, beaten, etc. all he went through, um, shipwrecked. But he says, when I come before God's throne, it's with the spirit of God, thank you, I, I learned from all of these things. So do be thankful when you enter God's presence. Um, and then you feel like another positive one? I'm feeling positive. You feeling positive? Okay, you can't stop me. So here we go. Uh, do remember to maintain an open line with God. Because you have one. He's waiting to hear from you. 
Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, I chose that uh, to sp- in my senior year at Dallas Seminary. I had to, for one of my uh, speech classes, uh, I had to s- uh, preach at church. So uh, uh, Dr. Sp- uh, uh, Dwayne Spikes, uh, our pastor, let me uh, preach uh, when I was a young man. And I, and I chose, uh, I thought, well, I'll do uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. That's not, there's not a lot, lot there to exegete. Pray without ceasing. You just memorized it, didn't you? <laughs> pray without ceasing. So does that mean that I'm supposed to pray all the time, 24-7? I'm at work, my boss tells me I need you to do X, Y, Z, and you're like, I am in an attitude of prayer right now. <laughs> right, right. You want your Uber driver feeling like this? <laughs> I need to go to this location in a moment. I am communing. I heard it Sunday morning, pray without ceasing. Is that what Paul meant? No. Well, Paul was saying you must have an attitude of prayer that you're so connected with God, you think about him so often that throughout the day you have multiple conversations with him. Do you? Uh, These are the great ways to pray. We're told all over the place how to pray. But Paul's going to stop in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, and he's going to talk to us about the mystery of prayer, like not how to pray, but what happens as we pray. I mean, like what's going on with the Trinity when I'm praying? So this is most interesting. Uh, Look what he says in verse 26 of Romans 8. It says, in the same way, or King James Version reads likewise, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. It says, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit interce- himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, God, the Father, who searches our, the hearts and knows what the mind of the Spirit is, um, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is amazing what Paul says here. He's not telling us how to pray. He's telling us what happens as we pray, because this whole chapter has been built on hope. And the hope is a, a motif we've developed since verse 18, because Paul's been talking about how to stay hopeful when you, as you fight the flesh, the sinful flesh. Because it's easy to go into a point of despair because sometimes the flesh gets the best of us and you wanted to serve God and then you gave in to temptation and you fell. And Paul says, don't lose hope. And he's going to go through uh, uh, this chapter, uh, 18 and following, giving you all the reasons why until Christ appears, you should be hopeful. So we want to add another one to the repertoire today, but we want to view, review the other three that he already talked about because it's been seven days. Were you here last week? Yeah, you, you might have forgotten those other amazing points from Paul, right? So you feel like you need a review? I, I do. Uh, so what did Paul say, that, just to kind of review, as to why should I be hopeful as a Christian until the Lord Jesus appears and comes for me? Well, reason number one, trials lead to, to triumph. They all do. Why? God's sovereign. He's going to take all the trials, all the adversity, all the things that you experience, and he's going to use them, as we're going to see here uh, in the next week, he's going to use them for our good. That he, that's how God operates. So he says, be hopeful in what you experience. God's hand is on the wheel of your life. And this is going to become amazing if you just continue to be obedient to him. Reason number two, cosmic degradation leads to cosmic transformation. Translated, as we saw last week, if you personify nature and enable it to speak, it would groan because of sin, what man has done for it. Remember we said last week, a new green deal will not fix the problem. Were you here? No, it won't fix the problem because the problem is sin. So the creation groans because of what man has done to it. Man can't fix it. The Messiah can. And when he appears, he will transform the cosmos and deal with sin when he step, sets up his kingdom. Uh, all throughout the Old Testament, this is foretold. So I have hope because as I watch the planet uh, degenerate and all about me degenerate, and not that we shouldn't do anything to slow it down, but, but the scriptures say, especially through the pen of Paul, there's going to be a cosmic transformation when Jesus appears. I look forward to that. Uh, reason number three, we talked about last week, personal consternation with sin uh, leads to personal transformation. That one day, what you see in your life, the sin you struggle with, the sin that easily besets you, the sin that you see about you that causes you to groan and moan at the television, etc. one day you're not going to groan anymore, right? Because you're going to be in the presence of Christ. And everything will be awesome at that point. And Paul says, think about your transformation when God glorifies you and resurrects your body, gives you a body fitted for eternity, think of what is coming down the pike instead of focusing all the time down here. But we want to add another point of hope to that. Reason number four why you should pray is you fight the world, the flesh, the devil. And uh, I love this thing. The, your praying or my praying is buttressed by what? His praying. Remember before Jesus was crucified, John 17, what's the last thing he did for us? Prayed for us. 
And do you think any of his prayers are fulfilled? Oh, absolutely. He prayed for, he prayed for his saints, his church, that we would, we would be unified. Uh, unity is a wonderful thing from God. A disunity is from the devil. And Jesus prayed for the unity of his people, etc. So he prayed for us. But what is interesting here, it's the spirit of God who is with us as Christians praying for us. Remember last week we talked about what biblical character? This is a test. We tested at our church. Who did we talk about last week in the Old Testament? One man, Elijah. Elijah. When he, when he was running uh, from Jezebel, he, you remember he wound up in what? A cave down in Mount Sinai. You know, he's, she's trying to kill him. She doesn't like his, his absolute Christian voice. You know, uh, she, she wants to terminate him. Uh, and he's hiding in a cave, and God comes to him with a still small voice and asks him one simple question. Why are you in here? I'm not done with you. You're not alone. And then he tells him that he has thousands of fellow believers who've not need, bowed their knee to Baal back up in Israel. He needs to get back to work. He's not alone. See, that's what happens when you are in a moment of despair with the world, the flesh, the devil. You get to points of despair where you wind up in the cave. And God comes to you and says, as we studied last week, come out of the cave. You're not alone. There's other saints that stand with you. Sometimes we feel alone. So in this passage, Paul circles back around and says, as a Christian, when you are battling the world, the flesh, the devil, never forget the fact that the Spirit of God is with you, and he's with you specifically when you pray. Notice what he says. He says, and in the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses, or, or our weakness. Let's just stop right there about the Spirit. In the same way, or likewise. Because he just said the creation groans because of sin. Then he said the believers groan because of sin, do we not? And now he says, but at a whole nother level, the Spirit groans. And then where is the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is given to you at the moment of salvation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says so. The minute you trust Christ, he baptizes you with the Spirit of God, 100% of him. Um, Ephesians uh, 1, 13 and 14 tells you the same thing. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, uh, 30 tells you the same thing, uh, that he seals you. You're his. He's with you. And so what, what is the Spirit doing when he's with me? Many things that would make an entire sermon series. One of the things that he does is when you pray, he's praying with you. You might look at your prayer life and think, man, there's sometimes I can't even articulate to God how I feel about a certain situation. Or it's an emotional thing. It's hard to articulate to God. I feel like I grope in the darkness. But as you're groping in the darkness, God says, don't lose hope as you deal with sin that the Spirit is, well, he's there with you to help you in what he calls your weakness. And we want to study this. Uh, and this is in two verses. How could we possibly talk for 30 minutes about two verses? It is not hard. Because in my estimation, these are some of the most mysterious, enlightening verses in the New Testament about the work of the Spirit in prayer. So I can explain this to a degree, and then there's a part of it I can't explain to you. Because I have limitations, because I'm finite, as, as you are. And so what does God say here? He says uh, in this uh, statement that uh, this, the Spirit helps, present tense. He constantly helps uh, in, our, in our weakness, is what he does. Um, it's a perpetual thing, uh, that he comes alongside you to help you. And it says he, he helps us in what is called uh, our inadequacy. Uh, uh, and I want to focus on the word help for just a minute because as I was reading my Greek text of uh, the New Testament, I was reading this word for helps, and it's just a, it's a short verb. How many, how many letters is, are in the word helps? Count them. H E. It's not a trick question. L P. Five. Five. Uh, in, the, in the Greek text, there's 17. Huh? That's for students to learn Greek to make it hard. No. Uh, <laughs> Why so many letters? Well, it's a really long word. How many know German? Oh, so good. Uh, what do they do with German, with words? Well, they have an issue, in my estimation. <laughs> they, think, they think that, you know, they take this word, that word, this word, and they staple them all together, and it takes up a whole sentence, and that is excellent. And you're trying to be a student reading this, and it's like, I can't even pronounce it in so many letters. It's the, the Greek does the same thing. They'll take a couple of words, stick them all together, and make up the word. Why didn't you just say helps? Well, because here's the thing. This, we're going to have a test, because I've told you this for 10 years. When you take a preposition and you add it to a word, what's it do to the word? Are you all new this morning? Okay, true or false. It intensifies it or it doesn't intensify it? Oh, now you know. It intensifies it. Yeah, don't you love grammar early in the morning? So it intensifies the meaning. What's interesting is this word doesn't have one preposition. It has, count them, two. 
too. So he's, he's not just saying, when you pray, the Spirit of God helps you, kind of. No, he adds a preposition to it to say, oh, no. He super helps you as you're praying. Oh, and by the way, I have to throw in a German word. He uber helps you. <laughs> and you're thinking, I thought that was a taxi service. Uh, well, no. What well, Uber, what does it mean? Over. Over. Unter means? Imagine if you named your taxi service Unter. I'm calling Unter. They're under all other services. No, Uber means, hey, it's the best. It's the top. And so Paul says, I'm going to stick two prepositions on that word help. I'm going to tell you when the Spirit of God comes down, to, or comes with inside of you to help you as he's there, as he's turned loose in prayer, man, it is help off the grid. Why? Well, because he, we have what is called weakness. And you're thinking to yourself, well, not me. Yeah, you. What kind of weaknesses do we have? List them. Moral, emotional, that's it, <laughs> physical, psychological, cognitive. I mean, the list is long, is it not? Uh, and, and Paul says, he, he comes and helps us in our weakness. Concerning that uh, concept, Kenneth Weist, Weist says this. He says, the, the word to come and help, this intensive word, speaks of the action of a person coming to another's aid by taking hold over against that person of the load he is carrying... And note well, he says, the person helping does not take the entire load he is carrying. Which means, if in prayer I am struggling with some concept, a diagnosis, that just totally blew me away. I wasn't anticipating that. Something tragic happened, some uh, job changes, whatever is happening. When you bring that before God in prayer and try to lay that out before God, and it is like a big, giant, long, telephone pole size heavy log you're trying to pick up, and you cannot pick it up by yourself because you can't quite express it all, the Spirit of God is there to come along and pick up the other end. He doesn't take it all. That whole let go and let God is not from God. Did you hear me? No, it says the Spirit comes along and He helps you. He super helps you, but He's expecting that you're going to pray too. See, He comes along and helps you in your weakness because we all have weaknesses when it comes to our, our nature. And then that then impacts our, our prayer life because he talks about our, our weakness. Our weakness. Well, what kind of weakness? Well, we have in one area cognitive weakness, meaning we have limited understanding of things. I mean, I'm smart to a degree, but then after a while, I don't know because I can't foresee all things. Uh, this whole concept, uh, he says, we do not know how to pray as we should. That's the truth. Because sometimes we pray about this, thinking this is got to be got the will of God, but it turns out later God had other plans, and he shows us his plans and his will, and then we have an aha moment, but God worked us to that position through prayer, because we had limited understanding. Uh, William Barclay says about our prayer uh, and inability to understand what God is doing as we pray. Uh, he says, first, we cannot pray aright because we cannot foresee the future. It says we cannot see a year or even an hour ahead. We may well pray, therefore, to be saved from things which are, are for our good. And we may, pray, may well pray for things which we would, uh, might do us ultimate harm. Second, he says we cannot pray aright because in any given situation, we do not know what is best for us. We are often in a position, he says, of children who want something which would be bound only to hurt them. God is often in the position of parents who have to refuse their children's request. Case in point. I'm shopping at Costco. Nathan is a little boy at the time. Now he's, I don't know, 36. He's a little boy. He's got an allowance. He's got money. He's thinking, it's burning a hole in my pocket. I got to spend it. You have children like this? Here, my son, read, read a Ramsey's book. You know, uh, Invest well. So he told me when they're walking down the candy aisle, he, and do they sell candy bars by single, co single candy bars at Costco? <laughs> Pallet. So we're walking down the candy aisle, and here's what Nathan says. Hey, Dad, I got some extra money here. I, I, I want to spend it on some candy. Okay, yeah. What do you want to spend it on? I want to buy that, that little that case of Skittles right there. <clears throat> case. Yeah. How many Skittles does a child need? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And so do you think I had to stop in the aisle, and let's talk to God about that. Do you, do you think God would really want you to have a box of Skittles? No, I as a parent knew immediately what the answer was. What do you think the answer was? No. No, you're so mean. No. It's just oral hygiene. My wife's in dentistry. Wipe his teeth out. And blood sugar level. Oh, no way. And if you eat all those Skittles, which I know you're going to cram them in your mouth, I don't want to be there to see what happens as you're bouncing off the walls. Uh, no. No, you, son, you can't spend your money on that. Isn't that the way sometimes it is in prayer? We ask God, man, God, this is what I perceive that I need now. 
And God probably looks down from heaven at time and kind of smiles at us and says, you just do not understand. I lovingly, and I have to tell you no, because greater things are going on here. And the Spirit's stepping in going, here, let me help you pray in that situation because you don't really know how to ask what you really need to ask for, but I'm going to help you. Can you relate? Aren't you glad the Spirit's there? Take Moses as a case study. Uh, talk about a great man of God. I mean, Moses, unbelievable man. Weather beaten, sandblasted, uh, faithful saint. Uh, he led the Israelites all over the wilderness for how long? 40 years. And it was a pleasant journey. <laughs> I've often looked at him and thought, man, that must have been the hardest pastoral job ever. <laughs> complaining, murmuring, griping, complaining, murmuring, griping for 40 years. So he finally gets to uh, the promised land after all these years. He's in his 80s, and he's in Jordan. I've been on those mountains, and you're looking across the Jordan River at Israel. Uh, and he wants to go in. Did he get to? Mm -mm, no. God told him, you're not going to get to set your sandals on the sand of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, amazing passage. Uh, Moses writes in verse 23, And I pleaded with the Lord, heavy on the pleaded. He did it more than one time. At that time, when I'm stuck on the other side of the Jordan, uh, saying, quote, here was my prayer. Oh, Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such mighty works as yours? Please let me go. <laughs> let me go and see the good land beyond the Jordan that good hill country and Lebanon too up in the north. God, consider my service all these years. Can't I just go across the Jordan River with everybody and just stand on the promised land soil? What did God say? No, no. In fact, uh, in verse 26, here's what we read. It's kind of shocking. It says, but the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me because of my pleading. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Huh? Do not speak to me of this matter again. You ever gulped when you prayed? Uh, he, God says, go up to the top of Pisgah, a mountain uh, in Jordan, and, and lift up your eyes uh, westward, northward, southward, and eastward, and look at, look at it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan River. What did he do that kept them from going in? One thing. Remember when God said, when the Israelites needed water, and God told them, you got the, you know, you, you can get water for them in the desert. I mean, I know where the aquifers are and everything. I, or you can tap into them. I know how to do this. Uh, go over to this particular rock and speak to it. And when you speak to the rock, poof, out's going to come water. Okay. What'd he do when he got over there? Do you know, this is Bible trivia. I know we're, my, my, my wife sold my Bible trivia set at a garage sale. So <laughs> I got to play somewhere. Uh, he... <laughs> What do you do with, this, with the staff? How many times? Two times. Bam, bam. I'm awesome. God said, oh, I'll give you the water. Uh, but you shall not ever go into the promised land because you disobeyed me. This tells you a lot about God that make, kind of makes you unsettled. If he tells especially a leader that everybody looks at, do this because people are looking at you. If you deviate, there's no deviation from law. He deviated and God said, that's going to cost you the land of promise. But I'm sure he was, you know, he was praying and he kept asking, 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 asking. And God says, no, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna go in because of what you did. But don't you find it interesting that many years later, Jesus is walking the planet, the Messiah, the Messiah is here. He's walking the planet. He goes probably to Mount Tabor along, you know, in the, along the uh, uh, eastern, uh, northern rim of uh, Valley of Armageddon. He goes up to that conal shaped hill, transfigures himself with Peter, James, and John. And who appears with Jesus? There's another trivia question. Moses, I'm moving your piece up a little further. <laughs> Moses and Elijah. Don't you know when Moses appears, he's like, oh yeah, I am on Mount Tabor. I I'm here. Mean? It just took a while. Like 1400s to, you know, 30 a AD. <laughs> Uh, is it not this way that God operates? Sometimes it takes him a while to show you, you the, the will of his prayer. But if you just hang on, either in the here and now or in the hereafter, he's going to say, here's your answers. Because the Spirit's in there. He's working with you to, to help you understand what God is doing. Because that's what the Scripture says here. Uh, many illustrations I could give you other than that. But I, I love what Richard Foster says. Richard Foster has a book called Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. Here's what he says. It says, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity, himself accompanies us in our prayers. 
When we stumble over our words, the Spirit straightens out the syntax. I love it. When we pray with muddy motives, the Spirit purifies the stream. When we see through the glass darkly, God, what are you doing in this? The Spirit adjusts and focuses what we are asking until it corresponds to the will of God. He says, uh, this, the point is that we do, not have to, we, do not, we do not have to have everything perfect when we pray. The Spirit reshapes, refines, and reinterprets our feeble, ego-driven prayers. We can rest in the work of the Spirit of God on our behalf. Amen to that. You know, my, my mother-in-law called me this week. She's, you know, she's dying from a failing heart, 15% heart capacity where she's at. She's on hospice. My father-in-law's got dementia. It's complicated. It's sad. It's complicated. It consumes much of our time. She called me this week, and she had some questions for me. Here were the questions. Why am I here? Why doesn't God take me? What's my purpose in this affliction? Can you tell me why I'm alive? You want that phone call? You know, I, you think I talked to her for 30 minutes about rich theology? No. I said, I, I, don't know, I do not know the under, I do not have to answer all those questions. I do know God's sovereign, and all things will be used for greatness. It says so. All things work, we'll get there next week. All things work together for those who love God. You've got to trust those truths. Uh, and God's working in your life to shape, refine you. But you need to be talking to him. Because even in the complexity, God, how do I pray about that? How do you pray about dementia? I feel like I grew up like a child in darkness, but I still pray. But then the spirit of God comes along and helps my prayer and helps that he, as I groan, he groans because he identifies with what I'm facing or what you're facing. And he says, here, let me explain that to the Trinity. This is interesting. This is mysterious. I close with verse 27. Notice what he says. He says, he who searches the hearts, God the Father, knows what the mind of the spirit is. Why? Well, because they're both omniscient. As because he intercedes the spirit for the saints according to the will of God. What's that mean? Well, I think what it means, and there's much depth to that. There's much mystery to that. But I think what it means is as you're praying and laying out your situation, what you're facing before God, whatever it is, job change, your husband deserted you, child's wayward, whatever it is. But as you're praying about that, the spirit of God is saying, man, I identify with your pain about that. But I'm going to stand before the father and we're going to have a conversation about you the Spirit, the Lord, the High Priest, and the Father. And we're going to help that prayer coincide with the will of God. What could be better? And so that there will come illumination because what the Holy Spirit intercedes for in your prayer life, he's going to do like what he did to Moses. Moses, you prayed to enter, but God gave you insight and wisdom as to why you couldn't. And it just took a while for him to give you that flash of insight. But the fact that he's working to fulfill his will, which is far better than your will, well, that's the awesome side of prayer. Because you're going to fire a lot of crooked arrows when you pray, right? And God can hit a target every time. It's called his perfect will for your life. Let's pray. God, we, we adore you. Uh, and we thank you that the Spirit resides in us. What a mystery that is. But uh, how wonderful to hear his voice as he speaks uh, to us. Hard to explain to a non-Christian that mystical side of the faith, but it is oh so real when you show up and your voice is most apparent. And when you do give uh, insight into our prayer lives and you do answer according to your great will, those are moments that make us sober up and really relish in who you are. Uh, may those who pray today and feel despair at the world about them, might they be given great strength and hope for the road ahead because the spirit is with them and is helping their prayers accomplish much as your will is worked out in their prayer life. In Christ's name, amen.